الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على الشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا وقرة عيوننا وإمامنا وقدوتنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله الأطهار وعلى أصحاب الأخيار ومن والاهم يحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منه وفيهم يا أكرم الأكرمين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم تنزيله بعد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والمؤمنون والمؤمنات بعضهم أولياء بعض يأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر ويقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة ويطيعون الله ورسوله أولئك سيرحمهم الله إن الله عزيز حكيم صدقت يا مولانا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله الحمد لله في رشتي الجمعة الحمد لله في الإسلام الله سبحانه وتعالى سيز القرآن لقد من الله على المؤمنين إذ بعث فيهم رسولا من أنفسهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored us. Men. Men is a favor that you can't repay. It's different to ihsan. Ihsan is a favor that you can repay. I do something for you, you do something back. Men. Allah is mannan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a gift, it's a gift that you can't repay. There's no repayment for it. Nothing you can do. And Allah says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ that Allah put so much emphasis in the, in, the, in the grammar of this verse. Now without any doubt, this is a favor that Allah gave you and me as believers that you can never repay, you can never be truly grateful for. What was that favor? What was that favor? إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولَ When he sent amongst them a messenger, min anfusihim From themselves. Firstly, our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's a human, a human being. He's from us. If an angel was to come to us, you can't relate to an angel, but you can relate to a human. Secondly, in that time in particular, he was from Quraysh. He was an Arab, and he was from Quraysh. The Quran was directly being revealed to the Arab, in their language, to them. And then specifically the Quraysh, from that tribe, the custodians of Al-Ka'bah, al Musharrafa. So this was a favor given to them, but given to all of us, in that our messenger comes to us, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as a human, so that we can learn from him and we can relate to him. And that's really important. That's really important. Why? Because in, in our time, in our time, and this happened in previous times, but more so in our time. Traditionally, you would have, I would have lived in a Muslim country, in a Muslim land, where whether people were religious or not, the culture was a culture that was infused with Islamic teachings. I'll give you an example. I don't know if you remember back, I can't remember how long it was, football fans remember this, where, oh I forget his name, the Turkish football player, somebody threw a piece of bread and... He picked up the piece of bread and he kissed it and he put it in his forehead and he put it to the side. And so the whole world's going, oh, what happened? Why did you do that for why? And he said, oh, because we were taught to honor bread. Now, he may not have known why he was taught to honor bread. You and I may not know truly why we were taught to honor bread. I don't know if you know this, but many of those that are Pakistanis here, you probably would remember that, you know when you have a plate of curry, salal, and you have what we call a chengir, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where you have the roti, the chapatis, you put the bread on the chengir, you know, the thing, right? Now, have you noticed that you always used to put the roti on top of the plate of salan? You never put the plate of salan on top of the, the bread. That you would put, they'd put the roti on top of the plate of salan. And sometimes you'd get told off for doing it otherwise. Why? So there's something about bread, but I don't know why. You may not know why. But there's a hadith of the Prophet where he says, Akrim al khubz. Honor bread. Honor bread. Now that was just infused. These sorts of teachings of the Prophet, I may not know, qala Rasulullah, that it's the messenger of God that taught me this, but it was part and parcel of life. The culture itself, the fabric, the fabric of society was threaded with the thread of Islam. 
So even though people don't feel like they're religious, don't go about knowing much about religion, generally their practice was, if even today in, in, in Pakistan, if you're trying to sell a house or land, what do you have? We call it haqq shufa, don't you? Where you have to sell it to your neighbor first. This is a shufa, which is a shari principle. Now a lot of people might go around just thinking this is a, a, a law in, 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 in Pakistan, but this is actually a sharia law. It's a law of Islamic law. But somebody may not know that, but it's infused into the culture. Part and parcel of society. Now that is a blessing that we don't have at this time. There are some things within, the, within society, like our society here, that are very much Islamic principles. We have a level of politeness, a level of, uh, uh, a level of freedom, a level of dignity and honor, all of which you can say, yeah, this goes perfectly in line with my religion. But by and large, the structure of society isn't taking its, I mean, the source of it isn't Islam. That makes our task harder. It makes it more difficult. And this is why this principle, which is a beautiful principle in deen, which is al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar, which is the idea of commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And this, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that you go down to Wickham Town Center and you stand there with your book and you start preaching the good word. That may be a way of doing it. But this is a little bit more subtler and a little bit more nuanced and requires a little bit more thinking from us as Muslims. Now what does it mean? Why is this important? The Prophet ﷺ told us that even the good, people that are good, if they are not commanding others to good and forbidding evil, that when they are destroyed, they will be destroyed with them. And the Prophet in one report gives, he gives it a hadith, where the Prophet gives an example of imagine you have people that get onto a ship. Some people are on the bottom deck, some people are on the higher deck. Now the people at the bottom deck, when they want some water, they, they go to the people upstairs and they say, well, we're just going to make a hole in the bottom of the boat so we can get our water. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going to harm you. We're not going to damage your floor. You're not going to see any holes. So what does the Prophet say? He says, if they, don't, if they stop them, they are both saved. If they don't stop them, they are both destroyed. And so I can go about my life. You can go about your life, maybe, if we're lucky. And we can be alright, kind of. We can create for ourselves a little bubble that we can live in. And that we can expect that everybody else is, is, is going to do okay. And we're just going to keep to ourselves. We're not going to say anything. We ain't going to think about anything. When that azab of Allah comes, we will be destroyed with it. And if you haven't noticed, we're in that process right about now. We're slowly, slowly, that wave that's been washing across is slowly, slowly taking us one by one, picking us off. And one of the reasons why many people who are trying their best, they still feel like it's so hard. Where's the amr bil ma'roof and the nahi anil munkar? Where was that moment of saying to somebody, ittaqillah ya akhi? Ittaqillah. Fear Allah. Fear Allah. Instead, the fear is that I'll be excommunicated from my family. People will call me stupid. Tuba lil ghuraba. Glad tidings be to those people. But sometimes we don't want to ruffle feathers. Sometimes we don't, want to, we don't want to shake up the household. It's hard. This is hard. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Allah tells us in the Quran, in tansuru, in tansuru Allah, yansurkum, wa yuthabbit aqdamakum. That if you give nusra, aid and assistance to Allah's religion, He will assist you. He will. That's His promise. Wa inna wa'adallahi haqq. Allah's promise is true. Sadiq fi ma yaqul. He is always truthful in what He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The promise is what? If you give nusra to my religion, then I will give you Nusra and I will make firm your feet. I will not allow you to go astray. And we ask Allah, Ya Allah, help us to assist your religion. Help us to assist your religion so that you will assist us and our children and our families. And that this La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, this most beautiful thing, the greatest gift, the greatest gift, which is knowledge of Allah, which is Islam, which is to be able to say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. 
Send salawat upon Al-Habib Al-A'zam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam To visit Mecca, Mukarrama To visit Medina, Munawwara This great history, legacy of Islam The producers of the greatest civilization That this world has ever seen Till this day, anyone that visits anything Around the world, it's always Muslim architecture Whether it's the Taj Mahal in India Whether it's the Alhamra in Spain Whether it's the old mud buildings in Timbuktu Whether it's the Bajai Mosque in Lahore Whether it's all of this or whether it's all the great mosques in Istanbul, all of that civilization from east to west, from the Maghrib, look at Morocco, some of the most exquisite and beautiful architecture there in, in, in Maghrib and in Spain, all the way to the east, all the way to the east, look at that, look at the architecture of the mosques in Malaysia, go and have a look, till this day, all of this, the, 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 the tourism that's going on is going on of Muslim civilization. What a gift that Allah gave us. What a gift that Allah gave us. But what if we lose it? What if in the, in the generation of plastic, we lose it? In the generation of when the mundane is no longer beautiful, we lose it. They used to talk about when you used to drive into a town, you know the welcome sign used to be beautiful. You know basic things, the traffic lights would have been beautiful because mundane was beautiful. There was ihsan and itqal in everything. But now, all of that's gone. It's all about plastic. It's about spending as little as possible. There's no beauty left. Beauty is slowly going. Islam is a religion of ihsan. This is a religion. This is arguably the bastion, the last stronghold of that religion. But that's going to come through al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi and al-munkar. And even the word ma'roof, urf, Urf, custom, is a word which means your culture. Ma'roof in this context means good. But if you change up, you know the Arabic, the Arabic language is very beautiful. If you take a word in the Arabic language, you know every Arabic word is based of three letters. Every word is based of three letters. Even if you change the letters, you muddle them up, there'll be a, a, a relationship in the meaning. There'll be a, a, a sort of link to it. Like for example, the word, here yeah, this word, Ain ra fa from which you get the word ma'roof calling to good. Ain ra fa. If you were to flip it around, what does good mean? What does it mean to be good? If you flip the ain ra fa, and let's go ra fa a. What does rafa a mean? Rafi' rafi' Naam. Something to be elevated. That's what it means, al amr bil ma'roof. It's calling to a higher standard, to a higher moral framework. It's calling to something that will elevate us in this world and the hereafter. That's what an amr bin ma'roof means. So what are we calling to? Alright, let's say we all make our niyyah today that we're all going to go out and we're going to start calling to good. Al amr bin ma'roof. What does that look like? What are we calling to? That's a big question, isn't it? Because you have to know what you're calling to. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the problem for us. Ma'ashar al-Islam. Maybe that's the problem that we don't quite know what we're calling to anymore. If you had to go out now, right now, I said to you, there's a group of 10 Muslim, non-Muslims out there, you have to go and give Amr bin Ma'roof. Go, com- command the good. What could be greater good than La ilaha illallah? Go and command the good. Where do you start? What do you say? What? It's a difficult one. So perhaps the first step in an Amr bin Ma'roof is realizing what Ma'roof is. What am I commanding to and do I have it? And Islam, my dear brothers, has the only moral framework. The only good and evil that you could know is through Islam. It's qala Allah wa qala Rasul. Whatever is good is what he said. Whatever is bad is what he said. There is nobody else that can dictate to us. This is our understanding of this world. Whatever he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever was said upon the tongue of the messenger. Now, I know there's lots of... Very, very small children here. So I'll speak in ishara just for a moment, just for the parents and the adults and all of that sort of stuff. And we, as parents that are raising our children, us that are going to raise these young boys, inshallah, bi fadlil mawla, to be men. And we are going to raise our, our daughters, inshallah, to be women. Mm. For them to be men, for them to be women. And these are the great ones, the great ones of our past. Our history is filled with great men and great women. Our history is filled with the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Hassan and Hussein and all of those great ajilla of this ummah. And our ummah is filled with the likes of Khadija and Aisha and Fatima. This is our tradition. These great noble personalities. And we hope that we can raise them 
to be like that. But then what is that? And we're hearing a lot of discourse now with the sort of brutalized, uh, sort of the brutalized, and I'm really offended by this, and I want to share this with you, and I'll end with this, that some of you may be completely oblivious to this whole discussion and conversation, and if that is the case, then <coughs> yalla namshi, alhamdulillah, washi mushkil, carry on, no problem, and, and avoid this entirely. But some of you may have been caught up in it, and I know a lot of people are because of the sort of questions that I get during the week and every single day. Because we live in a time where perhaps us coming to this land, this country, right, maybe three generations now for some of us, four for some others, have had to make a cultural jump that is unprecedented. In this country, in this part of the world, they had to go through two world wars and 400 years of cultural change from the Enlightenment to get to where they are today. We came over in one generation and had to do all of that and play catch up. And that has completely destroyed how we understand everything. From families, to structures, to how you understand relationships, to how you understand your relationship to Islam. All of that, why is it so confusing? Because it would have been easier had we still been there. It would have just been a natural process. If there was some change needed, that would have happened organically. But to have come across the waters to a completely different paradigm, and bang! That's the confusion of the age, stuck right there. What do we do? How do we figure this out? We've got to figure it out within one generation. Not 400s of years, 400 years, in one generation, and that's tough. Now based upon that, and for that reason I say, that it's important for you and I, what did I say? Al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat, hum, what's the verse? Awliya ba'aduhum? Naam. Right? That they are awliya of each other. They assist each other. There's a hadith where the Prophet said, Al-mu'min, Lil-mu'min kal A believer is for another believer like a building block. Yashuddu ba'duhum ba'da. They strengthen each other. Our awliya are who? Our protectors, patrons, friends, allies are Ahlul Islam. And we take our understanding of life from Muslims. We do not take it from anybody else. Yes. Kalimatul Hikmah Dalatul Mu'min Fa'ina Wajadaha Fahua Ahakku Biha. This is true. We can take a word of wisdom from anywhere, but we take our morals from our religion. So now, take one example with a sort of brutalized masculinity where it's been sort of punched and punched and punched and elbowed and kneed. And, and that's the, the reality where people are struggling with basic understandings of, of if somebody <clears throat> displays quote-unquote a masculine quality, if you can even say that, then it must be toxic, it must be poison, it must be despicable. In that sort of framework, people are struggling. We're struggling, we are. We're struggling to figure this out. And because we don't quite understand what we're supposed to do, anyone that we hear, a strong voice, we're running towards it. Whether that's people like Jordan Peterson, whether that's people like Matt Walsh, whether that's people like Andrew Tate, whoever it is, all of these names, and some of you are probably aware of these names, and if you know, you know, that people are running towards it, running, jumping on it, inviting them onto their shows, Muslims. And these are people that call to zina. These are people that call to riba, to interest. These are people that call to muharramat. They're not people that call to Islam. Hum laysuka mithlina. They are not like us. At li- they are not like us, let alone being our teachers. They are not our teachers. Our muallim is Sayyidul Khalq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Our muallim is Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our teachers are Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. They are our teachers. Our teachers are the salaf of this ummah. They are our teachers. Our teachers are the ajilla, the awliya of this ummah. They are our teachers. These are not our teachers. Be very careful of listening to them and be very careful from letting your children listen to them. Be very careful. Because they may sound like they are saying something that makes sense to us. Perhaps it's only because we've been brutalized and we've been beaten up. Perhaps it's because we're suffering a deep identity crisis. Perhaps. Perhaps that's the reason. Perhaps the reason we're listening to it is because it it makes our egos feel good. It strokes the ego. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe that's the reason. But in every question and so... For us, I think if there was a time that we had to return back to the seerah, to the life of the Prophet there was never a more important time. 
Because if you can spend hours listening to these guys on TikTok or on YouTube or wherever else, listening to their ideas, getting really happy, yeah, yeah, this makes sense, I feel great now, I feel like a man again, right? If that's the kafiya, if that's the feeling, we need to switch that off and we need to go back to the seer of the Prophet. That how did the Prophet behave? How did he speak? What did he call to? What were his manners? What were his adab? How did he view the world and how did he teach it? He said himself, Inna ma I was only sent as a teacher. So wallahi, we are in a very, very important crossroad. Where right now we are seeing Muslim institutions, people that have been in the Dawah game for a long time, that have gone down a rabbit hole. Where they are following anybody that they can that will give them some type of... And perhaps, why? Why do you need somebody else from a different community to come and tell you that what you're doing is right? Where's the identity crisis? I mean, where, what, what kind of identity crisis is that? Why is it if you say that this is right, it can't be right? What makes somebody else more special? What makes anybody else, any of the community, what makes them more important? Is it the color of their skin? Is it? Is it the color of their skin? Do we always need somebody who's lighter in complexion than us to come and tell us what's right and what's wrong? Do we need someone from a different religion to come and tell us that we're right? Is that what we need? Why can't we say it? What, take, what makes us so beneath everybody else? Nothing. نَحْنُ مَعْشِرَ islam We are the people of Islam. And we are the people of Al-Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahi anil Munkar. If in this world, by Allah billahi, wallahi billahi tallahi, Allah shahid ala ma aqul. If there's anybody in this world that can uphold a moral framework that will actually allow for a safe, without a deep mental and physical and spiritual issues, a moral standard, it's pe- the people of Islam. The people of Islam that understand Islam, that understand the sunnah of their messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I end by saying, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free us from right and left wing politics and Allah give us sunnah. May Allah protect us from what he said and what he's saying and their positions and Allah tells us and Allah informs us only of what he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah make the sunnah the most important thing in our lives may Allah protect us protect you may Allah protect our children may Allah in every single fard of our lineage in our offspring be people of la ilaha illallah such that we are not embarrassed on the day of judgment before our prophet we pray ya Allah that you conceal our faults you guide our hearts you make firm our feet and that you do not embarrass us on the last day before Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who gifted us this religion in the most beautiful way. And we bear witness that he gave, gifted us this religion. And if we messed up, then it was our fault. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq, for himma, for afia, for nusra. He is uh, akram al akrameen He is arham al rahimeen We have a good opinion of him subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will not misguide us. We say, sabbit aqdamana ya rabbil alameen. Ya akram al akrameen Ya Allah, make our... Our master make the source of our understanding of this world. Your beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and nobody else. Allahumma ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam.